now proceed with the reading of the first case on this morning's docket. It is case number 105401, State of Kansas v. Jorge Alberto Prado. Please the court. Adam Stolte with the Appellate Defender Office appearing for Mr. Prado. I'd like to reserve three minutes for rebuttal. Three minutes is granted. Thank you. Your Honor, this is a, this is a two-issue case resolving around one overarching issue, and that issue is that there was a conflict in this case that affected uh, Mr. Prado's rights at sentencing as well as during his attempt at withdrawing his, motion, his plea. On issue one, the district court erred by failing to inquire about Mr. Prado's dissatisfaction with counsel. Um, it's already that the district court, upon learning about that conflict, should have appointed new counsel for sentencing. At what point, counsel, do you think that duty was triggered? Where in the transcript does the defendant say anything that triggers this knowledge to the district court? It appeared in the transcript when Mr. Prado said when he first uh, was concerned about uh, that he was charged with rape. He said, he said, wait, I thought this was about touching. How can you change this to rape? At that point, this court should have learned that uh, there's something something was wrong with the, with the uh, effectiveness of the of defense counsel in Here's, this case. When, in your brief, what you said was it was triggered when the defendant said, my attorney has not explained things properly to me, correct? You're right, Your Honor. I'm sorry. And what's the next thing that the district court says? From there, the district court goes into the... What's the next thing the district court said? Let me read it to you. The court says, why don't you explain yourself a little more? Now, how is that sentence, that question, a failure to inquire? It's a failure to inquire because at that point, that, well, that kind of kind of this, these issues kind of get kind of confusing really quickly. At that point, once Mr. Prado makes that uh, makes that statement that he did not understand the charges, doesn't know what's going on. At that point, he has conflicted counsel because he's basically accusing his counsel of ineffectiveness. And at that point, the fundamental right to conflict-free counsel, which attaches during all critical phases of the of the proceedings um, is, is on. I, but my question, though, is how is this a failure to inquire? The defendant says, my attorney has not explained things properly to me. This doesn't, and then he says, then he, now he starts talking about the document, the charging document. He says, this doesn't coincide with the charges I was made. And then the court says, why don't you explain yourself a little more? Giving the, it seems like that's giving the defendant more opportunity to start talking. And I don't see where that's a failure to inquire. What was the district court supposed to do other than say, what are you talking about? Right. Well, the district court did ask that question. But the district court, what the district court failed to do was appoint new counsel so that Mr. Prado could, could elaborate better on his, uh, in, in, of his claim of ineffectiveness. Doesn't the district, I mean, here's my problem with all this. It seems to me like the defendant says, you know, you didn't expect, my lawyer didn't explain things properly to me. This charge doesn't match things. The district court says, explain yourself more. The very next thing the defendant starts talking about are the charges and his level of understanding. And there's quite a dialogue between the defendant and the court about whether the defendant understood the charges. And it seems to me that a factual predicate to whether there was a conflict was factually, did the defendant understand or misunderstand what the charges were? And the district court is asking a series of questions about whether the defendant understood what the charges were. So, it, and, it, and there can't be conflicted counsel, there can't be a failure to explain if in fact 
the defendant understood the charges. You see where I'm coming from? Right. I, I, so where does the failure to inquire come in? I, I still don't see a failure to inquire. Okay. The way, the way that I read the case here is that they had the plea hearing, and at that plea hearing, the, the, the district court went through the, the, the common colloquy. And but when they got to sentencing, Mr. Prado then said, wait a minute, this isn't what I thought I was doing. I didn't think that I was playing to two, two charges of rape. He thought that his, um, that his complaint dealt with the touching and not, not the rape. The problem is that, that the, that Mr. Prado wasn't adequately advi advised of his charges. And that, that, that happens with his defense counsel. What the district court, what we believe the district court was doing at this point was jumping ahead to, like in, a, in an ineffective assistance of counsel claim, what the district court we thought was doing was jumping ahead to like the second step and, and dealing with whether or not Mr. Prado was adversely affected by, by, by an ineffectiveness claim. The, the questions asked by the judge were, you know, I explained this to you. You explained, you understood this at the plea hearing. You can't come back and say you understand it now because I explained it to you myself. But the issue is that defense counsel did not explain this to Mr. Prado. And as soon as Mr. Prado alleged an ineffectiveness claim, Mr. Prado had conflicted counsel. And the, and the only statement that you have where there's a, I mean, Mr. Prado doesn't say, I want a new lawyer, does he? No. He doesn't say, um, Actually, he never even says he wants to withdraw his plea. Right. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out whether the district court isn't properly inquiring as to whether there's actually a conflict between the counsel and the defendant. And it seems to me that the first place you go to look is whether the defendant actually understands what the charges were. And that seems to be what the inquiry is all about. Right. Becky, up just a little bit. Mr. Prado didn't have to ask for, didn't, we can't expect someone to know. I mean, first of all, he's speaking through an interpreter. He's, he's uh, educated in Bolivia. He's not from the United States. We can't expect him to know that he has to say, I want to withdraw my plea. In fact, defense counsel in this case stepped up, partially fell on a sword and did that for him when he said, Your Honor, I think what's going on here, he says, may I interject? I think what's going on here is Mr. Prado is, is, saying that I did not inform him properly of the charges, basically making an ineffectiveness claim. To well, do I recall that the judge asked the defendant personally whether he wanted to proceed with the plea agreement, and he said no? Right, he did say that. Are you saying that's sufficient to advise the court that he wanted to withdraw that plea? That it, that is sufficient to, to to advise the court of that, and the problem is that after he made that claim, the current counsel, the only way that current counsel could do that is to say he had to step back because at that point he's conflicted. He had to step back. We can't we can't expect defense counsel to say to argue his his own ineffectiveness, which is what would have had to have happened if we were to go any further. But mm -hmm. I don't read. Excuse me. I don't read that you have challenged good cause. I don't see that that's part of your appeal, alleging that there was that there was good cause. You're, you're not challenging this on the basis that the court should have uh, granted withdrawal based on on good cause, are you? No, and, and that's part of the problem with this case. It's really easy to try to try to jump to that step, but the problem is that we don't. Mr. Prado did not have conflict-free counsel available to him at the time to, to address the, uh, the proper steps to get to good cause. There was no one there to help him ferret out the, ferret out the facts to find out what defense counsel actually, and, and uh, he actually talked about. Uh, isn't, that part of the, isn't that part of the calculus on uh, good cause, whether the defendant had competent counsel? Right, but we can't expect the, 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 that current uh, defense counsel to say I was incompetent. We can't we can't ex we can't put defense counsel in a position so to to have to, to have to argue his own incompetence, which is which is kind of what happened here. He did he, defense counsel did kind of step up on two occasions and say, I think he's arguing effectiveness, Your Honor. I didn't see a conflict before, but. 
perhaps there's one now. And I think that's actually the, to me, one of the most troubling things that the defense counsel said was I didn't file a motion to withdraw based on conflict because I didn't see a conflict. Right. I, I instead of being an advocate, the, the um, attorney took on the role of judge in that, it seems to me. Um, so it's it's a it's a it's a strange case because typically what I've seen in district courts is as I've seen them one, as soon as this allegation is made it's not an onerous burden to 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 continue this case appoint new counsel that's all we're asking here that's all we're asking is if they can just appoint new counsel have the plea withdrawal hearing with proper conflict free counsel and and we'll, and we'll see we'll know then we'll know if there's some kind of fundamental unfairness or there's good cause to withdraw the withdraw the plea here in this case and let him continue on with sentencing with conflict-free counsel it's a, I mean it's a real straightforward issue here that we that we raised in that it's, it's a fundamental right to have conflict-free counsel at all critical stages of the proceeding and, it, and in this case mr. Prado did not have conflict-free counsel as soon as he raised that ineffectiveness claim do you make any claim that his representation was adversely affected. Where do you see that? And I don't see that argument. But where where is that? I, where, I don't think we're at that step yet. I think the first step is to see if there's if there's a conflict free counsel. And once that's done, once we're, once we establish conflict counsel, um, the new the district court should have appointed a new attorney, and that new attorney would have been in better position than Mr. Prado to bring out that information, to bring out whether or not he was adversely affected, and that's what the district court focused on on this is whether or not he was adversely affected. He said, you weren't adversely affected, basically, because I, I went through this plea with you. You understood it then. You must have understood it. I thought you understood it. You must have understood it. But what should have happened was that the district court should have appointed an attorney to help Mr. Prado explain to the court what he didn't understand, what defense counsel told him in the minutes leading up to him taking that plea. And that didn't happen here. And the legal basis for this claim is all Sixth Amendment. You're not making a 22-3210-D argument. No, you are. And so it seems to me we have to work through the steps of the Sixth Amendment law. And so don't we have to determine whether there was number one an active conflict and then two whether the representation was adversely affected I, I don't think so how, how do you not get to adverse effect because we, we can't get there because the the record isn't developed enough we need, we need to send this back so that the record can be developed on that issue on whether or not on the adverse effect because the, the problem is that he he alleges that he did not make a knowing plea. If he didn't make a knowing plea, and he was sentenced under the plea, it's it's almost adverse effect. But the problem is that we can't know what he was thinking when he was making that plea, because he had conflict of counsel. Well, what more adverse effect can a criminal defendant have than to plead to a crime that he or she didn't commit? I mean, I don't know why you aren't standing there arguing that that's absolutely adverse effect he said I pled to a crime I didn't commit he said that in 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 court didn't he he did say that in court Do we have any further questions of counsel any further presentation there you are thank you thank you May it please the court, the state appears by Stephen Obermeyer. I, I think um, the suggestion that it, when there's the, the intimation that there may be a conflict requires the appointment of new appointed counsel uh, would create a very difficult situation for trial courts across the state every time there's just a mention of it. And in, in this case, there was never any mention by the defendant of his dissatisfaction with his attorney and the cases uh, that this court has issued require a lot more. Should we count in a situation where a defendant has to make a pro se motion to withdraw plea with, with his counsel standing beside him and basically arguing against it? Isn't that what happened here? 
I think the attorney was the one making the argument for withdrawing the he plea. He articulated, I think what my, my client's trying to tell you is this. But then he turns around and says, but judge, there's no reason to go forward because I told him every, I counseled him and I don't see a conflict of interest here. Um, he, he articulated the legal argument for the defendant, but then argued against the defendant's position. Or well, I, I think he was being forthright with the court that we've had extensive discussions on this case. Um, and he didn't file a motion to withdraw because he did not see a conflict. And then counsel said that uh, the defendant was at least implicating that he has not been counseled and did not understand what occurred regarding the plea. But that never came from the defendant's mouth. His his The essence of his complaint at the hearing was with the complaint. And the initial complaint charged him with one count of touching aggravated indecent liberties with a child. And I guess it could have been amended to two counts of aggravated indecent liberties with a child. Uh, but instead, his no contest plea was to two counts of rape. And, and you wonder why he was confused? Uh, I'm confused. Mm -hmm. why, why did uh, uh, allegations of touching uh, one time end up being a plea to two counts of rape? Well, uh, this was initially a, an in-custody charge, which we rarely do on, on sex crimes. Uh, but he was, he was arrested after he confessed was uh, taken into custody, and so he was charged with one kind of aggravated indecent liberties. At the time of the plea, the agreement was, okay, if he wants to go back on the grid and not face a Jessica's Law sentence, then he has to plead to two counts of rape and agree to a sentence close to 25 years with a uh, credit for time served. So that's essentially... Well, I understand what, what okay. the agreement between counsel, but okay. I'm, I'm saying a lay person that is alleged to have inappropriately touched a child then ends up at sentencing with two counts of rape based on sexual intercourse. It's not too difficult for me to understand the confusion. Okay. Well, uh, he signed the plea agreement which said that he was pleading guilty to two counts of rape. He was probably provided the affidavit in support and the police reports which set forth that it was uh, a rape. There were there were uh, penetrations there that constituted rape, and it was just more than aggravated indecent liberties. Um, also, on the plea agreement which he signed, uh, crimes convicted rape times two off grid person felonies. He signed the plea agreement, and if you read the transcript of the, of the plea agreement, he's happy with his attorney. He understands the charges that are against, are uh, filed against him. Uh, he's satisfied with all the questions his attorney. Has, has asked or uh, his questions uh, were all answered concerning the amended complaint to his satisfaction. That he had enough time to discuss the issues with this case and we're a week before the jury trial so he knows what the issues are. That may all mean he would ultimately lose his motion but why doesn't he have a right to an attorney to advocate his motion? Well he never made a motion to set forth that he was not dissatisfied with his attorney. We're going to expect uh, somebody, a layperson, acting through an interpreter to give us the magic script. I mean, he, what more could he really have done in layperson's terms to express his dissatisfaction with the plea? He said, my attorney didn't explain things to me. And it was very clear from the colloquy, at least as you read it on the paper, that he really wasn't understanding what had happened to him. Well, um... I think certainly the person at the sentencing hearing was different from the person who entered the plea when you compare those two transcripts. And maybe his dissatisfaction with, was with what the victims wrote in the PSI about him. Maybe the fact that they were there. The judge thought that it was uh, perhaps uh, buyer's remorse. But regardless, this court has said that the district court has to have a reasonable basis for believing the attorney-client relation between Prado and his attorney had not deteriorated to a point where appointed counsel could no longer give effective aid in the fair presentation of a defense. And defense counsel did obtain the downward durational departure that the parties had agreed to 
and uh, under the plea agreement. Well, the problem is you just speculated as to what his true reasons might have been or what the court thought his true reasons might have been. Right. But from the cold record, he was, this was a confused man. He, he, and he was speaking through an interpreter. And he really didn't understand why he was charged with one count of touching and pled to two counts of rape. And on its face, we, how, how would we speculate that this trial court... Uh, could discern what the true reasons, as you speculate, were. And his counsel wasn't able to do that either because he was telling the court, no worries, I explained everything to him. I think he's trying to argue this, but don't worry about that. So why would the trial judge have you know, speculated as to what the real reasons were? And how did the trial judge even know what the real reasons were? I, I guess not. But, but when asked uh, by the court, what, what is... Why don't you explain yourself a little more? His answer at page two is this charge has been dismissed and this is a different situation. This is the other one. It's not the same. And they discussed the amended complaint. Uh, and and uh, if you look at the cases where there is dissatisfaction with counsel, there's one case where a defendant's charged with premeditated murder. The attorney runs with a felony murder defense and the defendant during the entire trial is complaining about it. There's another where the attorney looks at her surveillance video, thinks that that's his guy, and doesn't present witnesses based on that. That's a justifiable dissatisfaction. Do we, do we have that in this case? Well, do we? At, at the point that the court is considering whether this uh, was a knowing plea and whether defense counsel adequately explained the agreement, at that point, doesn't the attorney have a uh, divided interest, the personal interest would be to say, yes, I performed my professional duties and adequately explained, but yet to advocate what the client wants, that attorney has to say, no, he didn't get uh, uh, appropriate advice. Why isn't that a conflict, an actual conflict of interest uh, at that particular point in the proceedings. I, I think the attorney is, as the attorney said, I, I did not, I don't feel that there's a conflict in this that, case. That's the problem, though. I, th I think the um, struggle we're having in our c communication here is the difference between the test for whether there's a conflict and whether there's ineffective assistance of counsel. And once a client alleges ineffectiveness, then there's um, bound to be necessarily a conflict between the uh, client's interests and the attorney's interests. Until the attorney says, oh, I agree with the client, I was ineffective, which isn't happening here, right? The client's, the attorney's position is I wasn't ineffective, I, I told him everything. So, I mean, they're arguing about that point. So th I think that's where we're struggling here. I think you're focusing on you have a duty to, you know, judge has a duty to inquire once made aware of a conflict between a client and his or her lawyer. Right. Um, and that's all well and good. That happened. There was an inquiry. But, but if you listen to what or read carefully what the client is saying and what the counsel confirms the client is saying, it's that the lawyer's been ineffective that the lawyer's been incompetent in failing to adequately inform him of the consequences of his plea. And um, that's the rub here. As soon as ineffective assistance is alleged by a client, then you have a natural conflict of interest between client and lawyer. And that's where, I think that's where my colleagues are struggling here. Right. You, had a, you had a conflict of interest at that point, and what your opponent is asserting is that, that that conflict of interest naturally arose, and at that point, his, law, his, his client had no lawyer, had no conflict-free lawyer, and that's where everybody's stuck. Can you address that point as opposed to the duty to inquire point when there's a, a conflict alleged? Because this isn't an allegation of conflict. This is an actual conflict that exists as soon as a law, as soon as a client asserts ineffective assistance of counsel. His assertion was the the complaint 
It's the nature of the complaint. My attorney has not explained things properly to me. This does not coincide with the charges I was made. Does that... And didn't counsel later say, I think what he's trying to say is that I was ineffective or I didn't inform him or... Right. I, I think everybody understands that, right? That that's what he's alleging. My, my attorney did not perform adequately. Did not perform, did not provide reasonable assistance. In, in, in most of this court's cases, that comes from the, the client stating that this, the attorney here is surmising what, what might be the problem with, with the defendant. Um, I, I guess I just, there's, the, the defendant is confused with the charges and the one count versus the two counts. I just don't see that as, as rising to the level of, of a, a conflict of interest where every time that happens, you have to with, have counsel withdraw and appoint new counsel. Um, where we don't have the irreconcilable disagreement, especially when you look at the transcript of the plea hearing, uh, when you don't have a complete breakdown of communications. And the attorney did say, we've had extensive discussions. Uh, this is on the eve of trial this, the, that the plea was entered, so the attorney had been uh, representing the defendant for, for several uh, months. And, and, and so what you're saying, what I'm hearing is if, the defendant is going to lose on the motion to withdraw that it's not doesn't have merits then the defendant doesn't have the right to have conflict free counsel to argue that motion i i think i'm saying i i don't see this as rising to the level of of counsel having a conflict and he's got a year after this case to file an ineffective assistance of counsel action uh, against his attorney and we can have a hearing on all the things his attorney did for him uh, during the pendency of that case and he can explain why at the plea hearing he had enough time to discuss issues on the case discuss a plea agreement with his attorney who answered all of his questions uh, concerning the case concerning the amended complaint to his satisfaction. He was thoroughly satisfied with his legal representation at the plea uh, And I guess he could later have a, a hearing on that. But, but, but he does have a statutory right to withdraw his plea before sentencing for good cause shown. And the fact that he could have an alternate remedy through a, a 1507 doesn't change the fact that that motion would be appropriate, appropriately made at that time. So the, I, I guess I'm missing what your point is that there's a, a separate remedy available because that's not really what's before. Well, well, as to the good cause shown, I mean, the judge denied the motion to withdraw plea that his attorney made. And his uh, attorney made and argued against. I mean, that's the problem we have. Right well, at the point where the judge asked the defendant, do you want to go through with the plea negotiations to Gay? And the defendant said no. Shouldn't the attorney immediately have asked for a continuance of the sentencing so that they could file a motion to withdraw a plea? Wouldn't that have been the obligation of conflict-free counsel? Instead of saying, oh, Judge, what I think he's asking for is to withdraw the plea, but let me tell you, we had extensive negotiations, and I don't think there's a conflict because I did what I needed to do here. He, the counsel said he was at least implicating that, and and I guess the judge's issue was that that was contrary to what was said at the, at the plea hearing. The, the question... Um, so, the, so both the judge and the defense attorney reached the merits with nobody having advocated for the defendant's position but, him, but the defendant himself. And all that he advocated was that the complaint didn't coincide with the charges that were made. He, didn't, he advocated that he didn't understand what it led to, I think, is the way I was reading it. He, he uh, I guess, I guess not. But, but, again, back to the plea transcript, he... That was a knowing. That's a great transcript for a plea hearing. That was a knowing involuntary plea. Uh, the, the question asked by the court at page seven of the transcript says, "Do you not want to go through with the plea negotiations today?" And the defendant says, "No. There should be some evidence here instead of just having a report saying that I raped somebody. There should be some proof." Uh, so, 
I mean, it does sound like he's trying to set, set aside the, uh, the plea or wanting to, to set that aside, but the judge uh, recalled the plea hearing and, and denied the uh, motion on that basis. And I, I, it just didn't seem, doesn't seem like it's a situation unlike the Wells case or, or the Wells case and the Williams case cited in the, in the 609 letter in the briefs. There's got to be an articulated statement of attorney dissatisfaction rising to that level. And, and uh, this transcript does not seem that, uh, that it rises to that level. So that's why I think that there was uh, no abuse of discretion by the district court in how this was handled and uh, would ask this court to affirm the uh, conviction. We have any further questions of counsel? Thank you, counsel. Thank you.